Assalamualaikum, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you today. It's an honor to gather with the Masjid Ali community for Imam Hussein Day. My topic for today and what I'll be discussing is the inspiration that we get from Imam Hussein, uh, social justice, and my own story. As you've heard from many of the speakers today already, the sacrifice of Imam Hussein and his family continue to animate and compel us towards working in the cause of social justice. I recently attended a powerful majlis at Princeton University. The speaker was Zakra Sharoz Jafar Dalla, and she had some very compelling words to share. My main takeaways from her lecture were that, that in commemorating the sacrifice of Imam Hussein and his family, we keep our hearts sensitive to the cries of those who are suffering. We never let ourselves become hardened to suffering and to injustice. We also ga gain the courage to stand up for what's right and the inspiration to keep struggling against what might seem to be impossible odds because it is our actions and stances that have meaning. Um, and I thank so much uh, Professor Marmon for talking about how that speaks to people across different communities and our other speakers as well. Since I mentioned that majlis at Princeton, I want to thank uh, Imam Soheb Sultan, who's a chaplain at Princeton University, for being open to having a majlis as part of the Muslim Life Program. I am so uh, impressed by him. And I think that many of us who have studied in universities in the US know that as Shia Muslims, we're a minority within a minority. And our perspectives are not always so welcome, even within Muslim student associations or those, those types of organizations. And I know when I was in college, I tried to organize a majlis for Ashura and I asked my Muslim Student Association at Georgetown University if they could just publicize it, and they actually refused to do it. So I had to do it independently, put up posters and things like that. So it's really a sign of progress that a place like Princeton, the Muslim Students Association, and the Muslim Life Program does that. So I want to really um, So you've heard that I am a mayor. And uh, I also am an academic, and my research is on uh, Muslim intellectuals in South Asia. And my current book project is off actually on the writings of an Indian Muslim writer named Isma Chukhtai, who you may know. Um, she lived from 1911 to 1991, and her work centers on social justice, and she talks about the impact in her childhood of attending Muharram Majalis. In her autobiography, entitled Gagazi Haberahan, Chukthai repeatedly positions herself as the voice of compassion in a cruel world. The archetypal sacrifices of Hussein and Alyaska remained abiding images in her work and ultimately became the subject of her novel, Ik Katraya Khun, which actually is a novelistic re uh, retelling of the story. In her autobiography, Gagazi Haberahan, she describes the first time she attended um, a Muharram Majlis, a gathering to commemorate the martyrdom of Imam Hussein and his family. Though she belonged to a Sunni Muslim family, her account of this story of martyrdom clarifies her appreciation for the power of religious expression. Recounting when she heard the story of al Yasker, the infant child of Hussein who was shot in the throat with an arrow, she wrote that she started crying loudly. And all the mourning women around her felt silent and looked at, looked at me in amazement. Why was it shot? The arrow in the throat, why was it shot? I yelled in my usual way. No one answered my questions. Through her unheeded cries and desperate pleas for justice, Jukdai attempts to elicit compassion for the victims of all forms of suffering. And the story of Alyaskar is not simply about the fate of that particular individual, um, that particular great grandson of the Prophet, but rather is a symbol for all the innocents who've been killed and abused. So even in, again, we've heard how this story speaks across communities, and it's not necessarily about your identity. It's just something that speaks to all of us. As for myself, growing up in Chicago as part of a Shia Muslim community and family, my religious education helped me think deeply about issues of injustice and commit myself to be someone who would try to make the world a better place as much as I could and try to make a positive change. 
My family was always well informed about politics and I think for many of us it's because politics impacts those that we love, potentially who live in other countries and other parts of the world. And I'm also lucky that my parents took me on family vacations, family visits to our family in Pakistan and also to Yemen. It was important for me to learn that life could be very different than my experiences growing up in the United States. This perspective is a strength that Im immigrant communities bring to broader American society. We have that perspective. As a high schooler, I was part of the Future Leaders of Chicago program where I met leaders in government and civil society. I even had the opportunity to meet someone who was then an Illinois state senator who is named Barack Obama. So little did we know then that he was gonna go out to become the president. When I was researching colleges, I was very intrigued by the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University because I thought that a career in diplomacy would fulfill my interest in different cultures. It was in my first week of school at Georgetown that the September 11th attacks happened. I remember the shock of myself and my fellow students as we could even see the Pentagon burning from our campus. And we saw um, tanks rolling through the streets. Obviously there was a communication blockade. Couldn't get in touch with anyone's families. I'm sure that like all of you, uh, we were all very heartbroken in those days in following those senseless deaths. And I was trying to, I was especially hurt to learn that the attack was conducted by people who said they were doing it in the name of Islam. And I think as a Muslim, it was just very, very painful experience. In the following weeks, I attended as many of the various religious services I could on campus, from the Muslim Student Association's Open Jumma to the Jewish Shabbat and the Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox Christian services, because they specifically opened them to the whole community. As I mentioned earlier, Shia students are usually a minority within a minority, and I think it's especially important for us to build connections and understanding with many different groups of solidarity. And in my search to try to understand this tragedy that had occurred just in the first week of college, I started taking as many courses as I could on Islam and Islamic history, texts, and materials, and I discovered the breadth of Muslim thought that I hadn't been exposed to. I spent my junior year abroad at the American University in Cairo and uh, did a summer program for undergraduate research at UCLA. It was my academic advisor who suggested that I look into going into academia. It wasn't something that I really knew about. I'd never known anyone from my community who was an academic in the humanities. But um, I felt that this was something that was very important and specifically to try to explain this diversity of thought within Muslim societies. And I wanted to focus on Islam in South Asia because that's actually the region of the world that has the most Muslims in it. And I explained that to my students, that Islam in South Asia is actually the most numerous <laughs> type of Islam out there. I uh, received a scholarship from UC Berkeley to study Urdu in uh, India, in Lucknow, at the American Institute of Indian Studies. And this was a really a powerful experience for me because it was the only time where the history of the place that I lived was directly connected to my Shia heritage. And I think if those of you who are from Lucknow or have visited it, it is very powerful to see the Imam Bara as the main site in a city. And my mom even came and spent uh, Muharram with me and attended all the Majalis there. After completing my fellowship in India, I pursued a PhD in the Indo-Muslim Culture Program at the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University. And my research focused specifically on secular thought among Indian Muslim intellectuals from the Progressive Writers Movement, and that's the, right, that's the movement that Isma Jukla belonged to. It's my academic career that actually brought me to New Jersey as my husband and I started working at Princeton University. Electoral politics had really not been on my radar. I had campaigned a bit for President Obama in 2008 um, and 2012, and it was actually during negotiations for the Iran deal that I started calling my congressman, Leonard Lance, who was very opposed to the deal. And I started calling him regularly on a weekly basis 
using scripts from the National Iranian American Council uh, to advocate for diplomacy and to say that I thought it was very important that we work in a diplomatic way and not in a you know warlike militaristic solutions to everything. Um, thank you. When I was in college, obviously, that was also the start of, um, of the Iraq War. And similarly, many of the types of issues that we're seeing today were anticipated by many of my professors who said that you know, there's bad things are going to happen. And um, I think as a student, again, I didn't really feel empowered to do much other than protest. And protest is very, very, very important. But I don't think I knew these other ways of trying to influence policy. So I started calling uh, my congressman very regularly. And it's very important to do that. You might be able to change some minds. But this was one person whose mind I wasn't going to change. And that was when I realized and I started thinking that um, people like myself who believe in human rights, who be believe in diplomacy, who don't want war to be our first solution, really needed to be in elected office. And I mentioned that to a friend of mine, and she told me about the Emerge program, which is specifically for women from the Democratic Party who are interested in running for office. And I did that program uh, in 2014. And that's really what connected me to many different levels of government in New Jersey. Um, that gave me the confidence, the knowledge, and the network to make running for office possible. And in 2016, I was actually campaigning for Peter Jacob, who was running against Leonard Lance. And I happened to meet uh, Councilman Rajiv Prashad there. And he met me, and he said, oh, you're from Montgomery. You should run for your local government. Um, our township at that time was five out of five Republican. I'm a Democrat, and I thought, okay, this is my opportunity. If there's no one running, I don't believe in uncontested elections. Also, I had a lot of support from Councilman Prasad, who said, you can do this. Um, and I ran a write-in campaign in 2016. I didn't win then, but in 2017, I ran on the ballot, and I won. And I was the first Democrat in a number of years, the only one. Thank you. Then in 2018, my party won the majority, and I was sworn in as mayor in January of this year. So I hope that my story illustrates what's possible when we get involved in our local communities. I think national and international issues are very, very important. But they play, they, they come up in our local communities as well. And if we're not represented there, then we're really missing out a chance to make an impact. There's no doubt that the past few years have been difficult for immigrant and Muslim communities in the United States. Yet we should feel energized by how much work we've done. One of the things that I would like you all to consider is to run for office. Um, I want to be that person who kind of plays a role that uh, Councilman Versad played for me. Because research has shown that women and minorities and immigrant communities often need to be asked, people from those communities need to be asked at least three times to run for office. So this is one of those times. I'm asking you all to consider it. And I hope others will ask you as well. Um, our communities can only be strengthened from the ground up. Most of us have heard Martin Luther King Jr.'s words, quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, end quote. In my organizing, I've learned an inversion of this saying that, quote, justice anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. No effort is too small, and indeed every major accomplishment has happened because of the small struggles of many people. It's also important for us to understand our part in the history of this country. As a predominantly South Asian Shia community, we are part of a particular history. Uh, the first Asian American to serve as a voting member of Congress was Dalip Singh Sand, who represented California's 29th district from 1957 to 1963. He and a number of other Asian Americans ran for Congress after the Immigration and Citizenship Acts were amended in the 1950s and 1960s. Prior to that period, Asian American immigrants as non-whites were excluded from seeking naturalization. So just let that sink in, that even if you were here, you could not become an American citizen. You could not have the right to vote. You could not have the right to run for office. 
This all changed after World War II when some of the most racist elements of US immigration and citizenship regimes came into question. It was in 1952 when the, quote, free white persons restriction of the Naturalization Act would be overturned and thus permit Asian and other non-white immigrants to become naturalized citizens. So that's a very important date for our community. Indeed, it was pressure from the civil rights movement which ultimately led to the landmark Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. I make this point because fourth South Asians whose family immigrated to this country in the mid 20th century until today, and my family is part of that, we were provided this opportunity because of the civil rights movement. To me, this illustrates the importance of standing in solidarity with all minorities and all disenfranchised groups, even if they don't share our exact same cultural heritage or background. People often ask me if my academic research has an impact on my government service. I'll provide one example of where it has, and I would say absolutely it does. During my first year serving on the Township Committee, there was an anti-Muslim bias crime where pork was left on a Muslim family's car. Though the mayor at that time's response was initially weak, he said, well, I'm sorry this happened, but you can't fix stupid, and unless it happens again, how do we know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I followed up by providing research on how pork is used to target Muslims, how Islamophobia is a type of racism, and as Milana was saying earlier, these sorts of symbolic acts are basically a testing ground to see like how far can we push? Can we do this? Then we'll do this. Can we do this? Then we'll do this. So it's very important to stop it when it's, even if it isn't physically hurting someone, it is still hurting people. And so that showed that that was a time when my academic research and also my background as an American Muslim did inform my decision making. And I started a discussion group called Montgomery Mosaic which is affiliated with the National Not In Our Town movement. And I'm so happy and so glad that you have made the theme of this event, um, Rising Above Hate. And uh, Not In Our Town is a wonderful organization that is all about local organizing to combat prejudice and hate. So we've regularly met to discuss topics like anti-black racism, anti-Latinx violence, and we've also had intercultural holiday parties and interfaith prayer services. Montgomery doesn't have an, a masjid within the town itself, uh, but we did have an interfaith prayer service and iftar this past Ramzan, and I believe it was the first time that the Muslim community in the whole town came together, as well as members from other parts of the community, and we had a, a crowd of about 150, 160 people there, which is really big for an event in Montgomery, so that was wonderful. Um, thank you. We've also made sure to host events at all of our local community centers. Uh, the first two were held at the local synagogue, the second two were at a Protestant church, the next at the Catholic church. Again, I believe it's very important for us to make those connections in our communities. Another one of the motivating factors for me to enter politics was to be part of the solution to the relatively low levels of participation of women in politics. The US ranked 75th in the world in terms of women's representation in politics, and I think most of you would probably agree that that's not right. Women from our community have a lot to offer, and we should make sure that we provide leadership opportunities for women within our institutions, and also encourage them to pursue their ambitions in terms of careers and service. And I think, I do feel as though I'm very lucky to have grown up as a Shia Muslim, because I've had so many powerful examples of women leaders from our community who are an integral part of our, uh, of our history, of our, of our uh, spirituality, and so we should see them as examples. To conclude, my advice for everyone is to take the message of social justice that we learn from the sacrifice of Imam Hussein and serve your community in some way. The way to rise above hate is to proactively build community. And I know that many of you are doing this in many different ways. I'm just encouraging you to do it even more. You can participate in the work of nonprofit organizations. Um, you can seek positions in appointed boards and commissions in your local community. You can sign up for formal training and mentorship programs. I mentioned some of the programs that I did because research shows that for 
uh, immigrant communities, for uh, minority communities, those formal training and mentorship programs are really important because otherwise we don't necessarily have that network. Um, once I became an elected official, I started meeting many people who would say, oh, well, my dad was the mayor of my town growing up, or my mom was on the school board. And I think for immigrant com communities, that's not as likely. So we need those formal training and mentorship programs. If you are able to vote, I would urge you to vote in every election. And despite everything that might be going wrong in our world, in our, in our communities, we can always try to make some sort of a difference. And that's the inspiration that we get from um, the example provided to us by Imam Hussein and his family. Again, thank you so much for having me, and I'm very proud to be with you today.